Yes, yes, cliched. Another Tudor watch video. We're talking about the Black Bay. What a surprise. I was curious, he says. Famous last words. I'm extremely fortunate to say that I now own the Black Bay 54. And to the gentleman out there who sold me this watch privately, you are an absolute legend. I cannot thank you enough for the opportunity. Now, the goal to this video is not to convince you whether or not you should like this watch. I think most of us have made up our minds already. But I wanted to ask you all this question. Is this the definitive Black Bay? Is this what the brand had in mind when they introduced the original model over 10 years ago? Has it taken them this amount of time to gain the confidence, the know-how, and the ability to produce a watch of this caliber and to present it to those of us who really appreciate the vintage nuance with something that's a bit more modern and contemporaneous? We've got a lot to unpack, so let's get into it. There are times in this hobby doing what I do when I truly feel privileged. Not only being able to present ideas and concepts to an audience, but to share in the enjoyment of a watch that we all collectively appreciate. It's something special. And I feel so fortunate to bring this subject to you. Granted, the channel has been very Tudor heavy and I'm going to be getting away from it for a while, but I wanted to really end off with a bang for a good few weeks or months. But this Black Bay 54 is worth talking about for a lot of reasons. And I said to myself that whether in a week from now or two years from now, this watch is going to end up in my hands. So let's get this important caveat out of the way before going into the details. I bought this watch to convince myself. As a diehard Pelagos owner, I wanted to know whether the Black Bay 54 could convert me to truly appreciate the watch and its identity. And I bought this with the full understanding that if I could not connect with it or understand it well enough to justify owning it, I would sell it to someone else. Look, I'm so fortunate. I already have two phenomenal dive watches. I did not need a third. I have one for the formal and dress occasions and the other for function. <laughs> Look, the fact of the matter is I bought this watch for content. This was a business decision, not an emotional one. Because truth be told, the Black Bay and I, I've never looked at it fully from an owner's perspective. I've experienced the 58 in both gilt and the blue variation. And in the past, I've found them to be great watches. Can't argue with that. But then there was always this feeling that there was something missing with it. That there was something lacking that, in essence, couldn't hold my attention for longer than a week. Now, maybe it was the slab-sided case or the crown with the exposed tube. Maybe, to me, it felt a bit cliched with what it was doing. The Black Bay being this collection of watches that play too closely into Rolex's camp. You know, calling it a super homage of sorts. But, of course, now we know that there is a lot more to these watches than meets the eye. Again, these are all personal thoughts and feelings here and your experience may differ. Undoubtedly though, we can't question that these plucky watches ooze character. A very important trait of watch design today that I think is lacking in a lot of areas. And these watches all exude charm. The announcement of the Black Bay 54 and it immediately became my wallpaper watch. This is a very bad sign, exactly what happened with the FXD when it was announced. But the reasons were different this time. Something about the closeness of its relationship to the original 7922 got me. Also having that link to the 7923 had me interested. Hearing about and reading these new specifications where they had brought the case thickness down, where they've introduced a new clasp system. Now they essentially took the 58 and reduced and refined the watch. Uh, that's pretty much my review in a nutshell. Now if you're new to the channel, I will talk about the genre of watches that I love and I follow. Two categories. The first, I am a huge fan of a one-to-one -one faithful recreation. A reissue where the brand is able to take MRI machines, x-rays and build the watch exactly the way it would have been back then in its original time. Except now, introducing it with modern componentry, modern movements, all of the modern refinements that we would want. Giving us the ability to appreciate some of that vintage styling and some of those cool quirky features, but at the same time allowing it to be a daily wearing watch where you don't have to worry about things like scratching the acrylic or getting water inside it, or having the movement magnetized. I mean, that's a big one. I love it because it allows us to enjoy that bit of melancholy and to understand the charisma, the character that went into these watches when they were first produced. As someone who appreciates design and the process, it's special to have something that doesn't necessarily get everything right makes you question the mindset. And the irony is, no matter how good or bad the designs are, designs of the past are seen today as icons. So even if there are terrible looking watches or just don't make any sense today, 
you can justify by saying, well, this watch has been around for over 50 years and look at it now. It's a lot of fun. But the second category I appreciate is when a brand understands its heritage, understands its design ethos, and is able to take not only its past inspirations, but fusing them into a modern package, giving us a modern watch that looks as relevant now as it was back then, but with all of those modern refinements, possibly with new case materials, new finishes, an upscale in size to emphasize its purpose, its function, maybe its niche that it's trying to meet. Now there's method to my madness. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to know that the Seamaster 57 fills that first category perfectly. It's a one-to-one -one recreation in almost every way. And I love it because it has all of that charm, all of that character. It's the first Seamaster 300 they ever made where the Tudor FXD is the polar opposite, where it has all of the modern traits, a modern size, but it is also the perfect execution of a dive watch in my eyes. And throughout this video, you will see the Black Bay 54 compared with these pieces. So this should be quite fun. But the history of the Tudor Oyster Prince, we're not going to go too deep into it. We will say that 1953, the Submariner was first debuted. 1954, very early part of 1954, we saw the 7922 introduced. And this was basically just a carbon copy of the Rolex Submariner of the time. This one housing an ETA-based movement, but had a Rolex case, Rolex dial, Rolex bracelet. But on this dial, you have some excellent quirks, like a rose logo and a smiling self-winding. Very soon after, in the next year, the 7923 was introduced. And this was pointed out to me by the previous owner of my Black Bay 54 that this new model actually represents the 7923 a lot more and can be easily noticed when you see the text on its dial. This was the only manually wound Oyster Prince Submariner. It came with a bracelet without end links that had pencil hands. It was a strange beast, but these two references, 7922, 7923, and the 7924, have been put together to create the Black Bay collection. They have been the chief inspiration. Now, the history of the Black Bay is very well documented. 2012, we saw the first example, the Heritage Collection. And this one played very closely. It borrowed a lot of inspiration from the 7922, all the way down to the Rose logo and the Smiling Dial. As we know, this was the early stage of modern Tudor and its development, and they were trying to reach a new audience with this collection. And I think it's safe to say now that it was almost an instant success. The Heritage Collection opened that door for new properties, new colorways, new dial configurations. And we've seen this line constantly evolve. The name Black Bay now houses chronograph calibers, GMTs. And repeated multiple times now, we've seen an adjustment in size. And the Black Bay 58, launched in 2018, has become one of the most successful watches in all of Swiss, Swiss watchdom. <laughs> and it was absolutely due to that slight adjustment to the size of case from 41 to 39. The emphasis of gilt on the dials and the bezels, the crown size, the red triangle with a clear, almost obvious link to that legendary gold finger Submariner, the 6538. There is not a day that has gone by since the introduction of the 58 where there is someone, there is a watch enthusiast out there that cannot get enough of this watch. They absolutely adore it. And at this point in 2018, 2019, it truly felt like the Black Bay had officially come into its own. It was no longer trying to mimic the Rolex name. It was very much its own established watch. And the reason why it has been so good, it intersects with everything that a budding enthusiast might want, where a vintage enthusiast might be interested, someone brand new to the hobby might be looking at. From in-house movements to a great size, to an affordable price point, to a rock solid built watch. It's a collection of pieces that picks up exactly where the neo-vintage Rolex from the 90s and the early 2000s left off. It's not trying to be a luxury item. The focus is definitely there, but it's also trying to be that tool watch for the masses. Now, refinement is an ever ongoing process of development. Years of experimenting, honing, testing, adding, and reducing. And you can see that ever since its inception, the Black Bay has been in a process of refinement. And I'll be frank with you, the Black Bay 54, it's a watch after experiencing the 58 a couple of times, the 54 feels like it addresses everything that I ever had reservations about when handling the 58. And let's be clear, when you're me, it's the little things that make the biggest differences that affect you the most. You know, the thickness of the handset, the counterbalance on the seconds hand, the chamfers on the case flanks, the bezel with the correct font. And the more I look at the Black Bay 54, the more I picture the word refinement again and again and again, in every area. A trim case, a flat bezel, neater crown, tighter tolerances, an improved clasp. The profile of this watch is astounding. And I'm not just saying that to give it kudos. It's something like four millimeters thinner than my Seamaster. And the Seamaster is not a thick watch. 
But what I truly appreciate is that this carries over to the clasp. It could have easily slipped up here. I mean, most brands do. They pay so much attention to one area like the case. They make sacrifices in other areas like in the clasp department. Tudor could have made the watch head too heavy or they could have made the clasp too heavy. You know, throwing off the balance on the wrist, but the clasp is just as slim. Marrying with the rivet links and the case, it is seamless when you wear it. Also note the basic things like the length of the clasp sits inside of the case. It's not over extruded. Much like how I appreciate the FXD for going that extra mile with increasing the knurling on the bezel and fully graduating it. I feel that from the case to the bracelet to the clasp, there was a clear intention to make this a harmonious design and a thin design. Now the criticisms I've heard about this watch, I'll be honest, they sound more like criticisms for the sake of it. What I've read, things like no hash marks on the bezel, the crown being too small, the bezel having polished knurling instead of brushed knurling, the watch itself being too small. And if you're following the way I look at watches through the two categories, category one being the love for the one-to-one -one reissue, category two being the use of modern design to bolster its modern development. All of these small quirks, that is the entire point of the 54. And it's a watch that I now feel bridges this gap that sits in between a watch like the Seamaster 57 and the Pelagos FXD. And let's just address the size very quickly. I'm six foot one, I'm 200 pounds, 90 kilograms. I've got a six and three quarter inch wrist, it's give or take 17 centimeters. This watch is deceptively large for its suggested size at 37. I will say up front it wears closer to 38 and a half than 36 millimeters. And this could be one of my criticisms that for someone who has a smaller than average size wrist, you might still struggle to pull this watch off. The benefit now is that the watch sits flatter and thinner on the wrist, but the lug profile still measures something like 46 millimeters, so it might push to the extremities of your wrist. Now, owning both the biggest and the smallest dive watch that Tudor makes, there is a stark difference between the two. The one in titanium with full graduations, a bi-directional bezel, a matte dial, you know, fixed bars. It's a brutalist design. It has amazing wrist presence. It functions like a torch in the dark. As a tool, as a modern dive watch, I believe it's perfect. Truth be told, whenever I get in the water, this is the watch that I would wear. The other is smaller, it's slimmer, satin dial, gilt, no graduations. It has a small crown, it's dressier, it's elegant. For a weekend away somewhere, dressing up a bit more formally as, a, as an ongoing daily wearer, this kind of watch meets the requirements of that original Submariner, something that blends the formality with the function perfectly. But with the added benefit of being so slim in profile that it could go under any cuff, no problem. So as a contrast, I would call the Black Bay 54 a daily wearer with a timing bezel as an added bonus. Now, do I think that the Black Bay 58 wearer will enjoy wearing this watch more? And that's a very difficult question to ask because it has to do with wrist size and presence and many other factors like how you use your watch. I would agree that in this process of reducing, the watch has lost a bit of that 58 character in a sense, the full gilt bezel, the red accent on the triangle. The bigger winding crown is more practical. It's obviously easier to use, but then how often do you wind an automatic watch? Now, don't get me confused. I think the Black Bay 58 and the 54 are completely different watches. In a sense that if we do look historically back in time, a model like the 5508 Submariner did not compete with the 6538. Basically because the smaller crown would indicate that it was 100 meters waterproof and more for the casual everyday wearer, where the 6538 was created for the professional with double the water resistance, 200 meters. So to the Black Bay 58 wearer, if you feel like there is something about the watch that's putting you off, like maybe the crown, like the bezel action, like the case flanks, maybe if you just want an update on the clasp, the T-fit system, it makes a big difference. I would recommend the 54, but this is housekeeping. This is 10% difference across the board. This is not a huge leap. This is not an entirely new watch. So does the 54 live up to the hype? Has this watch converted me? Is it an improvement? Yes. Simple answer is yes. Purely because I believe that this is the original vision of the Black Bay now in the metal. I believe that 10 years ago where the brand was still trying to find its footing Maybe it didn't feel confident enough. Maybe the ability that they had at the time, they were not capable of being able to produce a watch of this caliber with such tight tolerances, with an adjusting clasp system, with a much slimmer case profile. They've spent all of this time, over a decade, making the Black Bay a household name, 
making indicators like the snowflake hand its main characteristic, something that easily identifies the collection. They have established and put that seal of approval on the four digit crownless Submariner case design. I highly doubt we will ever see a reference 5508 or a 6536 or a 6538 given to us by Rolex. But at the same time, I also don't believe that we are going to see the Black Bay refined that much further on. It now has a rivet bracelet with a T-fit micro adjusting clasp. It now has the scale and proportions of a 37 millimeter diver, their original divers. It now uses that original crown. It has perfected the gilt dial, the satin finishing. It uses a more old school handset with a period correct seconds hand and counterbalance, but all the while hammering home that this is a modern watch with an officially certified chronometer movement. And we could say more of a contemporary clasp design and case profile. So in a rare case, if you're someone like me who has never considered the Black Bay for a multitude of reasons, some of the things I've mentioned, like the crown, like the knurling, like the thickness, I believe that the Black Bay 54 will be a watch that you will be happy with. And yes, while maybe it does lack a lot of character and quirks of the 58, I think it makes up for with its refinement. And if I'm trying to find a conclusion to this presentation, it's a watch that I believe does not draw attention to itself, but is at the same time so captivating in its simplicity. From a distance, it doesn't look like anything special until you take a good look at the dial, until you focus on the typeface on the bezel, until you see how well it sits on your wrist as a no-date dive watch. The original vision of a Black Bay that appreciates where it's come from, where it stands now, and all the while paying homage to that original Tudor dive watch that set the story in motion. It's been a wild ride. Truth be told, I did not believe that I would form a bond with this watch. Owing to past experiences with the Black Bay, I've just never seen them in the same light before. But I want to know your thoughts about this. Do you believe that this is the definitive Black Bay? As in, this is how they first envisaged the watch. I know there are so many variations in the collection which are probably a lot more enjoyable because they take more of a creative route. But do you feel like this was the way they wanted this watch to be presented 10 years ago. I'll leave that with you, and in a few months time, I will share how this watch has been faring on the wrist. I'll share my experiences and how I've enjoyed it. And until then, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. And I'll see you in the next one.